On the workbench today, I have a 2 to 4 GHz power divider from Warble Microwave. On this channel, I have reviewed quite a few microwave devices, such as directional couplers and Wilkinson dividers from them. They are a local company in New Jersey, and their products are manufactured here in the United States. I will leave a link to their website in the video description below, and be sure to check them out, as they offer quality products from splitters, couplers, hybrids, and other custom microwave components operating from DC all the way up to 26.5 GHz. The number of these kind of local companies has been dwindling over the years, unfortunately, so I do want to give them a shout out for what they offer. Now, as you recall, I couldn't do teardowns on a lot of the products they send me because they are of the current models and contain proprietary designs, which is totally understandable. Because people watching this channel are generally interested in the inner workings of things, they had offered me this older model, a 3-way 224 GHz power divider, so I can do a teardown in this video. And I'm definitely excited about it. Because this is an older model, and by the way, if you look at the data code, it is all the way back to 2012. Anyway, I couldn't find any specifications on Wearable Microwave's website about this unit. So before we proceed with the teardown, let's actually get a sense of some of the key parameters. And because the divider we have here is a 224 GHz one, I think my Nano VNA V2 is going to be more than sufficient. As you can see here, this one goes all the way up to 4.4 GHz. So I had already calibrated the device. You can see that the S11 and S21 are pretty flat, and also I just did the scale on the side. So we can see the performance of this divider a little bit better. Now, the first couple of parameters we're going to look at are the insertion loss and return loss. And these are important for any of these kind of power dividers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to terminate two of the ports. Now, it is very likely that at least these two ports are going to behave slightly differently given the construction. Of course, the outer two ports I expect would be similar. Anyway, so let's terminate these two ports. And let's put the VNA in onto the input first. And let's do one of the outputs. Want to make sure everything is tight. Now here is our captured results. And if you take a look, let's concentrate on the cyan line first. That's our insertion loss, the S21. And you will see that we start at around minus five decibels and we go up. It goes all the way down to roughly minus six, minus seven towards the higher end. Of course, remember the starting frequency here is at 1500 megahertz and ending at 4400. Although the device is only gonna be from two gigahertz to four gigahertz, I do want you to capture a little bit outside of the spec range so that we can see what the behavior is like when it's out of spec. And if you look at the S21 average, it's roughly at minus six decibels. And for a three port device, this is actually quite normal. If you do the math, ideally for a three port, we would be down for just under five decibels. But of course, given some of the internal structure loss and some of the imperfections and also the cabling, we're getting this minus 5.7 at this frequency here. So that's actually perfectly acceptable. And the S11 here measures the reflected power. And you can see that we do have some variations. And at some point, we're at roughly minus 10 decibels. And at other points, the best number we can get is roughly at minus 35 decibels. And if you look at up here, that peak here is actually outside of frequency range. So for example, if we come down here, you will see this is actually, this bottom here is actually almost four gigahertz. So that's the upper band of the frequency here. The same goes to the lower side as well. So here we're at roughly minus 18 decibels, and that's the beginning of the frequency band. So this is actually outputting from port number one. Let's take a look at port number two, as I suspect it will be slightly different because of the construction inside. Let me finger tighten this. And you can see that for the S21, we are pretty flat and roughly the same range at minus five, minus six decibels. But for the S11, 
we are seeing a little bit of different behavior here. And I think what I'm going to look at next is the isolation between these ports here. So for that, I'm going to terminate the input port. Let's do, uh, let's take the one off. And let's terminate the input. Now let's measure between port one and port two. And you can see that the S2 one is way down. So that means that we have very good port isolation between these two ports. And we do have some reflective power, as you can see here, between these two ports. That's indicated by S11. So let's actually do the same thing. And instead of looking at port 1 and 2, let's look at port 1 and 3. Because I suspect, again, given the construction differences among these three ports, the characteristics would be slightly different. So let me terminate port 2. And you can see indeed the shape of the S21 changed quite a bit actually, because I think we have a 12 here and now we only have one. But nevertheless, we have very good isolation as you can see between any of the two ports here. And what I want to take a look next is the return loss looking into this input port. So for that, I'm just going to terminate all three output ports and measure the S11 here. So let me terminate this one and terminate this one as well. So we essentially just measure the single port here. So here essentially is what you're looking at. That's the return loss looking into the input port with all the three output ports terminated. And we can see we do have some spots that are less than minus 10 decibels. But without referring to the original spec, we don't know whether or not this is actually within spec or out of spec. But that's beyond the point. The point of today's video, though, is we're going to open it up and take a look inside. All right, now with the basic measurements out of the way, let's open this thing up. Of course, we have quite a few screws here. And of course, we also have a warranty sticker. Of course, we don't need to worry about that. Let's, uh, let's see where the screw is. Now, maybe I need to peel it off first because I can't really, it's actually quite thick. Okay, so that's the screw here. All right, although it looks pretty simple here, there is actually quite a lot to talk about. The design of this Wilkinson divider looks very different than the 500 MHz to 6 GHz one that I did a teardown with a while ago. But these Wilkinson dividers are all based on the so-called coupled line topology. To broaden the bandwidth, multiple cascade sections are used here. As you can see, we have, I think there are seven of these sections in this specific design. Another technique used here is the gradual change of the transmission lines across different sections. In terms of the width, you can see here, this is wider than the following section, and so on and so forth. In some designs, you will see the lines themselves are tapered, which largely speaking serves the same purpose. But in this case, these are discrete sections. Sometimes you would see stops being used to broaden the bandwidth. Now, you can see we do have a couple of stops here. One is here and the other one is here. And it looks like these are soldered on later. So not entirely sure if the true purpose of these are to broaden the bandwidth or to fine tune the frequency response. I got to think it's actually for fine tuning the frequency response after the board had been made. The dielectric substrate used here, in this case, the PCB material here, plays an important role in RF designs. Typically, for these higher frequency uses, some kind of Rogers PCBs are used. Now, these Rogers PCBs have very low dielectric loss at high frequencies. 
Although the frequencies we're talking about here is not that high, only tops at 4 gigahertz, but just by casual glance, you can see that this is definitely not your typical FR4 fiberglass PCB material. And also to ensure performance, all these resistors here, not sure how well it shows on camera here, but these are the resistors I'm pointing at. These resistors are precision resistors and are sometimes individually laser trimmed after assembly when the performance of the devices are being characterized. And that's why a lot of these microwave passive devices are so expensive. Because not only the materials used are expensive, the amount of work involved in assembling, tuning, and characterizing each device is also significant. And that's also why you should always source your RF components from a trusted source. Oh, one last thing. Before I open this up, I assumed that the two outer ports would perform identically, and that makes sense because it should be symmetrical. But if you look at the middle port here, you will see that the trace is actually not symmetrical. So this definitely will impact the performance numbers ever so slightly between these two and these two in terms of isolation and other characteristics. But of course, when they designed the device, everything has already been taken into consideration. Well, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover in this video. I hope you find this video useful and learn something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.